now we start a discussion on uh, descending tracks, descending tracks or descending motor pathways, descending motor pathways. Descending tracks are of two types. The first type is corticospinal or pyramidal tract, corticospinal or pyramidal tract. The second type of these tracks is extra corticospinal or extra pyramidal tract. Extra corticospinal or extra pyramidal tracts. The descending tracts, other than pyramidal, other than corticospinal, these are included in the extra corticospinal tracts or extra pyramidal tracts. So descending tracts other than corticospinal or pyramidal are included in the group that is the extra corticospinal or extra pyramidal tract. Now first of all the corticospinal or pyramidal tract. Corticospinal or pyramidal tract. The tract arises from the cerebral cortex. It originates from cerebral cortex. 30% fibers originate from primary motor area. So 30% from primary motor area and other 30% from premotor and supplementary motor area. So another 30% from premotor and supplementary motor area. And remaining 40%, remaining 40% are from somatic, somatic sensory. So 40% of the fibers in this tract are from somatic sensory, somatic sensory areas. So keep in mind that fibers which are 40% fibers in the this tract are from the somatic sensory areas. Corticospinal tracts consist of about 1 million, 1 million nerve fibers. And most of the fibers are myelinated, myelinated, but slow conducting. Myelinated, but slow conducting. Only 3% fibers. So just 3% fibers, which are nerve fibers of the best cells. Of the best cell, these are relatively fast conducting. So fibers which are 3%, which are the nerve fibers of the best cells, these are fast conducting, fast conducting. Right? Now after origin from the cerebral cortex, the track fibers pass through chroma radiator, through chroma radiator, and then through internal capsule, then through internal capsule. Now in the internal capsule, the tract fibers occupy genome, G-E-N-U, genome means bent portion, occupy genome and anterior two-third of the posterior limb of internal capsule. So in the internal capsule, the tract fibers occupy the geno. Geno is the bent portion. And anterior two-third of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. When we distract the fibers for the upper parts of the body are towards geno. Fibers for the upper parts of the body are towards the gene. Now from the internal capsule, 
detract descent into the midbrain, in the midbrain, in the midbrain, in the midbrain, the tract occupies middle three fifth of crust cerebri or cerebral pedunca. In the midbrain, the tract occupies middle three fifth of the cerebral pedunca or crust cerebri. So in the crust cerebri, the fibers of the upper parts of the body or the upper parts of the body are medial. Are medial. From the midbrain, the tract fibers enter the pons, enter the pons. In the pons, in the pons, the tract is divided into bundles. The tract is divided into bundles by transverse pontocerebellar fibers. So when the tract enters the pons, it is divided into bundles due to transverse pontocerebellar fibers. From the pons, when the tract enters the medulla oblongata, enters the medulla oblongata, the bundles of nerve fibers join together on the anterior surface of the medulla to form to form pyramid. So when the bundles of the nerve fibers enter the medulla of the meter, the bundles of nerve fibers join together to form a pyramid shaped swelling called pyramid. So pyramids are on the anterior aspect of the Metal law of the right? So these form pyramid. And keep in mind, the name pyramidal tract is given to this tract because the tract fibers form pyramid along the anterior aspect of the metal law of the meat. So the name pyramidal is given to this tract because the tract fibers form pyramid along the anterior aspect of the metal of the meat. Now in the lower part of metal of the meta, 80% of the nerve fibers cross over to the opposite side, to the opposite side, and this is called motor decussation in the metal law. So fibers which are 80% of the tract, these cross over to the opposite side in the lower part of the metal law of the gata. And after crossing over, after decussation, these fibers enter the spinal cord in the lateral bite column to form the lateral cortical spinal tract. So after the motor decussation, the fibers which are 80% these cross over to the opposite side. These cross over to the opposite side. And these enter the lateral bite column. These enter the lateral bite column to form the lateral cortical spinal tract. So after crossing over, after motor decussation, the fibers enter the lateral white column to form the lateral corticospinal tract. Fibers which are 20%, we don't cross over. We don't cross over. These enter the anterior white column of the spinal cord to form the anterior corticospinal tract. So uncrossed fibers, they enter the anterior white column to form the anterior corticospinal tract. Fibers which are 80% which cross over and these form the lateral corticospinal tract. 
the fibers in the anterior corticospinal tract, which enter the anterior white column of the spinal cord. These descend in the spinal cord to terminate to terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column after crossing over. So fibers in the anterior cortispinal tract don't cross over in the middle. They enter the spinal cord in the anterior white column and these terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column and before termination these cross over to the opposite side these cross over to the opposite side and keep in mind that the track fibers first synapse with interneurons which in turn synapse with the motor neurons which include the alpha motor neurons and some gamma motor neurons. So keep in mind, termination of the track fibers is not direct with the motor neurons. First, the track fibers synapse with the interneurons, which in turn synapse with the alpha and gamma motor neurons. Nerve fibers in the anterior corticospinal tracts, these terminate, these terminate into the cervical and upper thoracic segments in the spinal cord. So the nerve fibers in the anterior corticospinal tract, these terminate into the cervical and upper thoracic segments of the spinal cord. Cervical and upper thoracic segment of the spinal cord. Upper thoracic and cervical. Right? And termination is not direct with the motor neurons in this segment. It is through interneurons. Nerve fibers in the anterior cord spinal tract are thought to be from supplementary motor neurons from supplementary motor area. And these fibers are involved in the positional or attitudinal movements. Positional or attitudinal movements of the head and neck and upper limbs. So nerve fibers in the anterior cortical spinal tract are involved in the control of positional or attitudinal movements of the head and neck and upper limb. Say, position to climb up. So you, you see, movement of the head and neck and upper limbs. Right? And these nerve fibers are present in the anterior corticospinal tract. And these nerve fibers are thought to be from the supplementary motor area. Supplementary motor area. And these terminate onto the motor neurons in the cervical and upper thoracic segments of the spinal cord. So this is the fate of the anterior corticospinal tract. Right? And keep in mind, before termination, these fibers cross over in the spinal cord. Then these terminate onto the motor neurons in the spinal cord. The fibers of the lateral spinal, lateral corticospinal tract fibers of the lateral corticospinal tract, these terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of spinal cord at various levels. So nerve fibers in the lateral corticospinal tract, these terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of spinal cord at various levels. And keep in mind, termination of these track fibers is not direct with the motor neurons. These first synapse with the interneurons, which in turn synapse with the motor neurons. 
is first synapse with the interneurons, which in turn synapse with the motor neurons. Only nerve fibers from the bed cells, only nerve fibers from the bed cells, which are 3% of the total nerve fibers, these has direct termination with the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of the spine. So only nerve fibers of the bed cells, these have got direct termination with the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of spinal cord. Now as the tract descends, as the corticospinal tract descends, 45% of nerve fibers terminate in the cervical segments of the spinal cord, 45%. 20% terminate in the thoracic segments and remaining 35% terminate in the lumbar segments. So the tract fibers terminate 45% in the cervical segments, 20% in the thoracic segment and remaining 35% in the lumbar segments of the spinal cord. You see, more termination of the corticospinal tracts is on the segments which supply, which supply the limbs, upper limbs, lower limbs. Right? So more termination in the cervical segments and lumbar segments these segments of blood, the limbs in the body, limbs in the body. So what is the function of the corticospinal tract? Function of the corticospinal tract? Corticospinal tracts control voluntary, voluntary, precise, skilled movements, especially of distal parts of the limbs. So the corticospinal tracts, their function is the control, the control of voluntary, precise, skilled movements, skilled movements of distal parts of the limbs. Say the fine skilled movements of the fingers and hands. So these are controlled by the corticospinal tract. Collaterals from the corticospinal tracts. Collaterals from the corticospinal tracts. These go to the caudate nucleus, lentiform nucleus, lentiform nucleus, red nucleus, olive nucleus, inferior olive nucleus, and also reticular pouch. So collaterals from the corticospinal tracts, these terminate, these go to, these go to the caudate, lentiform nuclei, red nucleus, inferior olivary nucleus, and also reticular, reticular pouch. These are the collaterals from corticospinal tract. Now another small pathway is cortico bulbar tract, cortico bulbar tract, the same origin as cortico spinal tract, same origin as cortico spinal tract, so cortico bulbar tract fibers cross over to the opposite side, cross over to the opposite side to terminate onto the motor nuclei, onto the motor nuclei of cranial nerves in the brainstem. And these cross over to the opposite side before terminates. So cortico bulbar tracts terminate onto the motor nuclei of cranial nerves in the brainstem and these terminate after crossing over. These terminate after crossing over. So just for the board, the cortico bulbar tract. 
Now I have discussed about the corticospinal tracts, their formation, their function, and then their termination in the spinal cord. Now we come to the extra corticospinal tract. Extra corticospinal tract or extra pyramidal tract. And these include these include rubrospinal tract, rubrospinal tract, tectospinal tract, tectospinal tract, reticospinal tract, reticulospinal tract, vestibulospinal tract, vestibulospinal tract, olivospinal, olivospinal tract, and then descending autonomic pathways. Descending autonomic pathways, these are included in the extra corticospinal or extra pyramidal tract. So among these tracts, which are extra corticospinal, the first one I discuss is rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal Rubrospinal tract. You know, red nucleus, red nucleus in the tegmentum of the midbrain. Red nucleus in the tegmentum of the midbrain. So, rubrospinal tract originates from the red nucleus. Originates from the red nucleus. Red nucleus. And then these cross over to the opposite side. Some cross from, so let us say, the origin is from red nucleus. Red nucleus. And these descend. These descend. So, rubrospinal spinal tract originates from the red nucleus. You see? And these descend to the forms. And medulla, and then these enter the anterior white column of spinal cord, of spinal cord, and these terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of the spinal cord. They terminate onto the motor neurons on the anterior gray column of the spinal. Cord. Now, red nucleus has connections with the cerebral cortex and also with the cerebellum. Also with the cerebellum. Also with the cerebellum. So, rubrospinal tract forms an alternate pathway, an excessive pathway. Rubrospinal spinal tract, it forms an alternate pathway, excessive pathway through which cerebral cortex and cerebellum controls the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of the spinal cord. So rubrospinal spinal tract acts as a Excessive pathway, alternate pathway through which the cerebellum and cerebral cortex control the activity of the motor neurons in the anterior gray cord. spinal tract is facilitatory to the flexors, facilitatory to the flexors, and inhibitory to the extensors or anti gravity. So, rubrospinal tract is excitatory to the flexors and inhibitory to the extensors or anti-gravity muscles. And don't forget that rubrospinal tract, it acts as an accessory alternate pathway through which 
cerebral cortex and cerebellum controls the activity of the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of the spinal cord. This was about the rubrospinal tract. Next uh, extra cortispinal tract is tectospinal tract. Tectospinal tract. Tectospinal tract. You know, spinal colicus, spinal colicus is in the tectum of the midbrain. It's in the tectum of the midbrain. So this tract originates from the superior colliculus. Originates from the superior colliculus in the tectum of the midbrain. And the tract fibers cross over. The tract fibers cross over to the opposite side. These cross over to the opposite side. And descend to the pons medulla to enter spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the tract is in the anterior white column spinal cord. In the spinal cord, the tract is in the anterior white color spinal cord. The tract fibers, the tract fibers culminate, culminate onto the motor neurons, onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column of spinal cord in the upper cervical segment. In the upper cervical segment. So tectospinal tract fibers terminate onto the motor neurons in the anterior gray column spinal cord in which segments? Upper cervical segment. Upper cervical segment. This tract is involved. This tract is involved in the control of reflex postural movement. Reflex postural movement in response to visual stimulation. So tectospinal tract is involved in reflex postural movement in response to visual stimulation. Uh, I am standing. Bright light is shown behind me. Bright light is shown behind me. My head and eyes return reflexly towards the back. Right? So in the movement of the head and neck, the tract is involved, tectospinal tract. So involved in the control of movement of head and neck towards the source of visual stimulation. And this is the function of the tectospinal tract. The tract fibers terminate onto motor, onto motor neurons in the upper cervical segments of the spinal cord. So this was about the tectospinal tract. The next tract is reticulospinal tract. Reticulospinal tract. Reticulospinal spinal tract, as the name indicates, it originates from a reticular formation of the brain stem. Originates from reticular formation of the brain stem. What is reticular, reticular formation? Reticular formation consists of 
groups of scattered neurons and nerve fibers. So groups of scattered neurons and nerve fibers in the midbrain bonds in medulla oblongata. This is the reticular reticular formation. Reticular formation, reticular formation, or should say reticular spinal tract, it controls the activity of alpha and gamma motor neurons. Controls the activity of alpha and gamma motor neurons. Hence, control the motor. Hence, control the motor activity. There are two parts of the reticulospinal tract. Pontine having origin from the pons and medullary and medullary. So pontine and medullary. The pontine reticospinal tract originates from pons. Right? And this tract is facilitatory. This tract is facilitatory to the extensors, facilitated to the extensor. You see, this is the retrospinal tract, right? And the tract fibers of the region, these cross over, and it is facilitatory to the reticular, uh, to the, to the extensors or anti-gravity muscle. The medullary, medullary reticospinal tract, medullary reticospinal tract, which originates from the reticular formation of medulla oblongata, is inhibitory, is inhibitory to the uh, extensors or anti-gravity muscle. So medullary reticospinal tract is inhibitory to the extensors or anti-gravity muscles. So pontine is facilitatory to extensors or anti-gravity muscles, while the medullary component is inhibitory, is inhibitory to the uh, extensors or anti-gravity muscles. Now we've discussed today about the corticospinal tract or pyramidal tract. And among the extra or spinal tract group, we have discussed about the rubrospine, which forms an alternate pathway through which the cerebral cortex cerebellum can control the, motor, the activity of the motor neurons in the anterior gray column. And then keep in mind, rubrospinal tract is facilitatory to flexors and inhibitory to extensors. Then we discuss about the tectospinal tract involved in the control of reflex posture movement in response to visual stimulation. And then we discuss about the reticospinal tract which affects the activity of motor neurons, the pontine component facilitatory to extensors and the medullary component is inhibitory to the extensors or anti-gravity muscle. We stop here. We'll continue next week.